So let's uh, jump right in here. Proverbs chapter 10. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says the Proverbs of Solomon. Now we're getting to a point here where it's a lot more, you're going to find a lot more subjects being breached in the, in the Proverbs here. You know, first nine chapters really dealt with very specific topics kind of within the chapter divisions. But now we're going to, we're going to start, you'll start to notice it starts to bring up, in many cases, it's going to be seemingly um, unassociated verses. But I think, and the more I've studied the Proverbs, the more I've read them, I've found that there is reason why they're grouped even in the way that they are, um, that there is relation between the subjects that are brought up. So we're going to look through here and... Um, we're, you know, one of the things that, that unfortunately I probably just will never have enough time to get through every single topic that's going to come up because there's, as, you know, the farther we get, we're just getting packed with a lot of good wisdom, and these pretty like and, you know even one problem, one verse is is enough to like preach an entire sermon off of. So we're going to do my best, and we're going to do you know try to get through this, and you know it's possible. I haven't decided. I'm going to try to stick with my schedule of doing an entire chapter a week, but if it really just gets to where there's so much content, and I feel like I need to get through it, then we'll 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 go um, and, and postpone it and have the the follow up the next week. But um, I don't think we'll need to do that today. So let's look down here because it starts off here the Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. And we're going to be in, the, in these, you know, verse 1, we see this kind of come up multiple times in the book of Proverbs where like, you know, why son, a son that's doing well, a son, a son, a son that has wisdom, like his dad is honored, his dad is, is proud and happy, you know, over that. But then like when the son does bad, it's like bad for the mom. And I think one of the main reasons for that is, um, you know, the, the mother is the one directly, mostly influencing the rearing of the children. Now, of course, I do believe the father has a role in that and ought to be guiding the entire house. So if the son grows up right, that means mom did her job and ultimately dad did his job, meaning that, hey, everything's great. So the dad could, could take um, comfort knowing that everything is going the way that it ought to be going in his household. But when the child grows up bad, hey, mom's the first person to look to for, um, for the child not turning out as well. And you kind of find that throughout the, throughout the scripture. So, um, but let's keep going here. Verses 2 through 5 all kind of have a similar um, theme here dealing with our prosperity. So look at verse number 2. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing. So it means, you know, when you receive payment or money or treasures that you get from from wickedness, that word of, in the context of the Bible, by and large, for the, almost every time it's used, means from. The word of means from in, in the way that we speak today. So treasures of wickedness means the, the stuff that you gain from an evil, you know, an evil source. We're doing things bad, you know, uh, uh, stealing, for example, or, or whatever. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can make and dishonest income, right? Lying to people. Maybe you're selling something and you're, and you're lying about it or it's broken or, you know, whatever. Uh, it says treasures of wickedness profit nothing. So you think you're making a lot of money. The Bible says that actually profits you nothing. But righteousness delivereth from death. Way more important. We're going to see the, the, the difference between being concerned with the riches of this world versus living rightly and having life being delivered from death. You know, the much weightier matters have to do with doing what's right as opposed to just getting some financial gain in this world. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. And keep that, take that to heart. What does it mean to famish? It means to, to become hungry, to become famished and, and, not, and be in want of, of food and be in need to, to have some food. Just become so poor where you're, you're famished. And the Bible says the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous. So if you're doing what's right, and this is reiterated in the New Testament also, Jesus Christ said, you know, um, you know think not to... Uh, uh, I'm going to misquote. Let's keep reading here. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the substance of the wicked. So if you're doing what's right, he says you're going to be taken care of. 
You know, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed. He says, because that's what, you know, the, basically the people of the world can care about that. Just, just the heathen, the unbelievers, that's what they care about. But he says, um, you know, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Right. And um, I don't know why my brain just went blank on that. It's such a popular verse. It's easy to quote. But um, that's saying the same exact thing that we see here. God's not going to suffer you to famish. You need to worry about doing what's right. And see, a lot of times people have their priorities backwards where they're focused more on their job or their income and making that money. And then doing what's right comes secondary. Going to church comes secondary. You know, whatever church you're in is secondary. The soul winning that you're doing is secondary. Everything else is secondary to, well, I just got to make sure I put food. Look, making sure you have food on the table is important as a man, but it's not the first thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things again. You know, the first thing that you seek, the first thing that we do with our paycheck should be the, you know, the, the tithe of the Lord. The first thing that we do you know, with, with every aspect of our life ought to be centered around the Lord. The first. He gets the first fruits. And if you're doing what's right, you don't have to worry about it. You say, well, I don't know what's going to happen with my job. I don't, you know, I, and I love it when people will make a decision to pick up and move their entire family and move across the country and move across the world or move wherever. We have you know, Angelica visiting with us today from Kazakhstan and she wants to move literally across the world to get into a good church. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Right. And I know and you know what? I know that God's going to bless her for it. I don't think that. I don't hope that. I know that. Right. I know that for sure. I know that God's going to bless her for making that type of a move because she's putting first... The kingdom of God. And you know what? I'm not worried. You know, she doesn't know where she's going to work or how she's going to make money or anything like that. But I know she's not going to be famished. Right. I know that the Lord's going to take care of her. And anyone that makes that decision. This is, this is open for everybody. You have the faith. You put God first. And you say, you know what? I'm going to make decisions in my life based on the priority of serving the Lord. You will never go hungry. Amen. You don't have to worry about that. It's a promise from the Lord. Just as much as I believe that Jesus Christ has saved my soul... And giving me the free gift of salvation, I believe that God will not suffer me to famish as long as I'm doing righteous, as long as I'm doing what's right. Now, if I just get into all kinds of sin and live some wicked, drunken, you know, adulterous life or something, then I probably will famish. You know, I, I will suffer. You know, that's not a promise to just live in a, a life of, of, of total unrighteousness. But if you're doing what's right, he's not going to suffer you to famish. He says, he casteth away the substance of the wicked. See, the wicked go out and they try to get more and more. He says, yeah, I'm just going to throw that away. Because God could just make your riches come to naught in a second, in a day, just wiped out. I mean, think about like stock market crashes. I can't imagine like how many wicked people just had like tons of money out in the, being invested and stuff. And then the market's crash and it's like, uh, millions of dollars just disappeared overnight. Gone. Verse 4, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. And this is a good work ethic on how you ought to be. You ought to be diligent. He said, you know, the hand that's other, if you stay on it, and if you do what's right and you keep working at it, you know, this is this is great wisdom here, but you know, the slack hand, the lazy person, the sluggard, someone who who's not diligent, they don't care that much. Well, that's when the poverty is going to come. If you want to, you know, if you do want to have just any type of, of, you know, wealth to support, you know, you want to support your family because it's a godly thing to do. First thing you ought to do is be serving God. But not only that, you ought to be diligent in your work. You ought to be working hard. You ought to be, you know, whatever it is that you're doing to try to earn money, do work hard at it. You know, don't be the lazy one. Don't be the one that, 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 um, Everyone looks to like, oh yeah, this guy, you know, he's never doing anything. Like, we've got some guys that, that literally sleep on the job. Liter- yeah, I've never, I've never heard of that before. But um, anyways, I don't want to go off on that topic because it's just mind-boggling. 
Verse number five. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. So again, linked with the verse just before that, being a hard worker, gathering in the summertime, getting in there ahead of time, getting out there and working hard at the harvest as opposed to just sleeping. Being lazy, sleeping in, you know, in a farmer, I don't know like that much about a farming life because I've grown up in cities and stuff, but I know and I've read and I, you know, that, that it's not easy work. And especially during a time of harvest, you're getting up at like before the crack of dawn and getting started on the day and you're working through all the daylight hours that you have until the sun goes down. And it's like that all through the whole harvest and that lasts for weeks and weeks and weeks during that harvest time. And that's a lot of work. And if you want to get the, the best increase of your labor and, and, and of the crops, then you have to be doing that. Otherwise, you're going to lose some. Otherwise, it's going to spoil. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get the full potential when you, oh, I'm going to sleep in. I'm tired. Oh, I got a headache. Oh, uh, you know, uh, I'm achy or whatever. You need to be diligent in order to receive that just just even the the, the 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 goods of this world but obviously apply that to the spiritual righteousness also doing the things for god hey stay diligent with it it's no different than the other work that you do you need to to be on it and not be slack or lazy when you're dealing with how you serve god turn if you would to psalm 37 We're going to see some, uh, some more wisdom, actually, from the psalm on the same topic of this uh, of prosperity. Just flip back a little bit, Psalm 37. Look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Same concept that we saw in Proverbs there. You know, trust God, do good, do what's right, and hey, you'll dwell in the land and, and you'll be fed. He'll feed you. Now, he doesn't say you're going to have a mansion and a, and a Mercedes Benz and, you know, all this, you know, all the world's riches, but you'll be fed. You know, you'll be clothed. He'll, he'll take care of you in that way. Verse number four, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And so he goes now beyond just being fed. He said, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, delighting yourself in the Lord is coming from your heart to begin with. So, again, the desires of your heart at that point, when you're delighting yourself in the Lord, it's not going to be on all the riches of this world. right? So don't, don't abuse these scriptures when he says that. But... That's not where the great blessing lies anyways, is in the, the, the riches of this world and in, in the, the physical goods that are all going to be burned up. So it's great news, actually, that the desires of thine heart, when you're delighting yourself in the Lord, those are going to be you know, great things in your heart that, that you're going to be receiving that he is going to give you. So it, it's going to be a good benefit. Anyways, jump down to verse number 16 in, in Psalm 37. The Bible is a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. Don't ever be deceived by the riches of the wicked. Just just having a little bit. So if you're you're a righteous man and you just got a little bit, that's way better than you know combining the riches of right. of all of these wicked people. For sure. And you're way better off than they are. Right. Don't be deceived by the by that riches. Look at verse number eighteen. Bible reads, "The Lord knoweth the days of the upright." And their inheritance shall be forever. Praise God. We have an inheritance that lasts forever. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt or thieves break through and steal. That is the true riches that we have by virtue of being saved and by the righteousness and the work that you put in for the Lord. You have the the inheritance just of being saved. That's salvation inheritance. But you also receive the rewards of the work that you do. Right. That are eternal rewards. Look at verse number 21. Bible reads, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. Obviously, if, you're gonna, if you get to a point where you need to borrow money to help you through, pay what you owe. Don't, you know, it says you're wicked. If you don't pay your debts, 
That's wickedness. When you just borrow and then you just don't pay on it. And I, I've seen Christians get into this. Or I've heard of it. At least I've seen, you know, I, I've heard of people that that you know rack up money on their credit card, and then just, well, I'm not going to pay that bill. I'm just going to file bankruptcy. That's wickedness. Right. You know, don't think. Yeah, you know, people try to always try to justify their sin, and they'll say, you know, oh, well, these big banks, and they're, you know, they are charging usury and all this other stuff. Well, you're the one that got involved with them to begin with. You're the one that's that's making the deal with them. You're the one saying that I'm agreeing to pay this amount and signing your name to it and giving them your word that you'll just pay them back for the money that you're borrowing from them. That's wicked when you borrow and you don't pay back. Don't uh, just because the government has offered some plan of bankruptcy doesn't mean that you ought to just go and do that. I mean, you need to work your tail off to, to do what you can. First of all, don't get in the mess to begin with. But second of all, if you are in a mess, you know, pay it down. Yeah. Pay your debts off. And I don't care if it takes you, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever. Pay what you owe. Otherwise, it's wickedness. It says, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. See, instead of borrowing money, you're giving money. So the wicked one's borrowing the money and not paying it back. Just, just give me, give me, give me. I just want to accumulate all this wealth and I'm not going to pay it back to you. But the righteous one isn't borrowing all the money. He's actually saying, here, 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 I'll help you out, I'll help you out, I'll help you out. That's the righteous thing to do. Why? When you have the right attitude, for one, I mean, the money's not going to mean that much to you. Obviously, it has serves a purpose. You're going to need some, but you don't care about it. You say, okay, you know what? You need more than I do. I'll help you out. It's a good attitude to have. Verse number 22. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Another great encouragement of the steps of a good man. Someone doing what's right. Hey, God's going to order your steps. He's going to light up the path for you and, and show you the right way to go. And yeah, you know what? You may fall down. Yeah, you may stumble. You may make mistakes. You may fall along the way. But praise God, the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You know if you're going to be doing what's right. You don't. You know, you may fall down. You can't say that if you're doing what's right, you'll never fall down. You'll never stumble. But if you're doing what's right, you know that God's got your hand. Amen. That God's right there to pick you right back up again. And that's a, that is a, a great comfort to have that knowledge and another good reason to do what's right. You know, people always say, you know, when you go out soul winning, telling them that, you know, doing what's right doesn't get you to heaven. And some, it boggles some people's mind to just think that, like, what, what do you mean? Then why are you out doing this? Why are you even talking to people? If this doesn't get you to heaven, then why are you doing it? And people just can't comprehend that there are so many motivations to do what's right. It's not just because of your fear of you know, fear of going to hell. It's not what it is at all for us. Right. We know that we've been saved through the blood of Christ. Amen. We don't have to do good to, to, to avoid hell. Hell is not the only motivating factor to do what's right. And in fact, it's not a motivating factor to do what's right. It's a motivating factor to put your faith on Jesus Christ and get saved. That's right. The motivating factors for doing what's right are many. One of them, I'd like to have God hold my hand so that when I stumble, He's right there to pick me up. There's a good motivation to do what's right. How about, I don't ever want to um, be famished. That's a good motivation. I want to make sure that I'm fed all the days of my life. Because God's right there. Hey, if, you, if you're doing what's right, then that, that'll happen. Right. There's so many. I don't want to be chastised. I don't want to be disciplined by God either in this world. Another good motivation. I want to earn rewards that don't fade. I want to have an inheritance that's going to last forever. Another good motivation. Look at verse 25. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. That's a pretty good, uh, a pretty bold statement there too, you know. David's here saying, you know, I've been, I've been young and now I'm old throughout my whole life. And just in my, his own personal testimony says, I've not seen the righteous person. I've never seen God forsake the righteous or his seed begging bread. You see people begging bread all the time. People off on the, you know, off the freeways. You see, you know, you walk by people on the streets. They're begging for bread. They're begging because they don't have any money or anything and they want to eat.
If you live right, if you're doing what's right in God's eyes, you never, you will never get to that point. And that's why the people that you see that are begging like that on the on the street, they need more than just money. And if I'm ever going to help anyone out like that, what I usually try to do is try to help them. One, obviously, I try to give them the gospel, but um, they need, you know, they they need some help. That's not, you know, their money isn't going to solve their problems. They need to get right with God. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, you know, God provides many ways of people being taken care of. It could come from alms from somebody else. It could come, you know, there's many means that your support can, your supply can come from. But ultimately, you know it doesn't matter where the means come from. If you're doing what's right in God, you won't be begging bread. Which makes me think that these people that are out begging bread, they're, they've got a problem with God. And that needs to be fixed. So uh, the best way to help those people, I think, it would be if you, if you do, you know, if you're going to spend some time with them, try to talk to them and you know, help them figure out what their problem is and show, you know, lead them to God and be like, look, th- this is a great verse to show them. Because you don't, you don't know their lives. You're not going to be able to judge and, and be able to tell them everything that they need to do. But if you at least show them that, be like, look, you, you're doing something wrong. You know, if you had a heart to give them homes, great. But, but you know, try to you can help them out even more by showing them verse like this. Yeah, that's right. And and lead them to a good church and be like, hey, get, you know, show up here. You're welcome there. It, you don't have to. You don't have to. You know, it doesn't matter if you haven't taken a shower. You just show up there. You know, and and this will help you. This will help you more than the than the two dollars I've got in my pocket or whatever. This will help you way more, and, and you know I think that's the best way to deal with people like that is to try to help them in that way. But we know that we have promises from God that aren't going to be broken because it's written down in Scripture. Let's go back, if you would, to uh, oh, look at verse number twenty. I sorry, I got one more verse I didn't read there from Psalm thirty-seven. Bible well, says, "For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints." They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. God loves judgment, that says. God is a judge. God loves righteous judgment, which is the only judgment he does. Righteous judgment. But he never forsakes his saints. It's a great verse. Again, another verse for soul winning. It says, they are preserved forever. Preserved. God preserves his saints we are, he never forsakes us. Great eternal security verse right there. If that's um, you know, something to maybe add to your repertoire, something that uh, <clears throat> you want to show somebody that, that, look, salvation is forever. God loves judgment, and he is a judge. And the wicked, they're going to be cut off. But if you're a saint, if you're sanctified in Jesus Christ... You'll never be forsaken, and you are preserved forever. Just like his words are preserved, they are they are guaranteed to be around, to be around forever. Go back through it to Proverbs uh, ten. So those first five verses were kind of dealing with like prosperity and just and just riches and our attitude on that. We'll go on to the, to the next section. You look at verse number six. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. So now we're going on, uh, still talking about walking and doing righteously, being a just person, living what's right. But <clears throat> instead of now the, the, the prosperity aspect of it, it says that blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked, and the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. So the name that you have, you, you ought to value your name in this world and, and the memory that you're going to leave behind because that is that encompasses what you've done with your life. The way that people remember you is going to be based on the things that you've done, on your actions. And... Hopefully you're living in a way where you're mindful of that. A lot of people these days don't think about the big picture at all. They're just living for the day. They're living for the moment. They're living for whatever pleasure they're going to have in this short period of time. And they might set up goals and oh, I, want, I really want to get a boat. I really want to get this house. And you work and you work and you work and everything is focused around those things. 
Think about, fast forward, then what, you know, what is the end of your life going to look like? All this time that you're investing in those things, I mean, are people going to remember you because you had that awesome boat? Like, is that real? Do you, are you really going to care that that's how people remember you? Like, I, oh yeah, he's the guy that brought us out to the lake, and man, he had that, that great, you know, like, so what? How do you want to be remembered? The Bible says the name of the wicked shall rot. If you're just living a life of wickedness and sin, your name's going to rot. It's going to stink. And, and people aren't even going to want to remember you. But the name, the memory of the just is blessed. You know, hopefully you can live your life and be able to look back on a way, well, well, here's all the things that I've accomplished. And at least people knew me as a Christian. At least people knew that I was a man that if I said something, I did it. I was a man of my word, that I wasn't just a hypocrite, that, that I believed the Bible and lived it to the best of my ability. And you can look back on that, and you know what, that is a blessing. And that can still do good for people even after you're gone on this earth. You can still, that, that memory can, can continue on and be used um, to even bring truth unto others after you've already deceased. And that's, that's a great name that you want to be able to have. Verse number 8. It says, the wise in heart. Well, I got, I got one more verse. I have this on my second page here. Proverbs 22, 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Obviously, doing what's right and having that good name is way more important than being rich. Which is exactly what I was illustrating with, the, with you know, oh, you had this great boat or whatever, whatever it is, you know, this great house. So what? A good name is much better than, than all of those riches. Proverbs 10, 8. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. He that winketh with the eye causeth sorrow, but a prating fool shall fall. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. There, in that last verse, verse 11. You know, it says a righteous man is a well of life. The life and the, and the, and the violence are like they're just complete opposites. So if you're doing righteously, you know, righteous man is a well of life. Your mouth, the things that you speak are going to be good things, a well of life. But violence covers the mouth of the wicked. And, you know, if you're doing what's right, you're going to walk surely. But um, like in verse 9, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. Don't think if you're, when you're doing wickedness that you're just getting away with things. It's all going to be coming to light and be made known. But I want to focus in here on verse number 12. The Bible reads, Hatred stirreth up strives, but love covereth all sins. Now, I'm going to teach a little bit on this subject of just hatred and hating in general today because... There's a lot of people that I think don't have a biblical view on this. Some of them are false teachers and false prophets, but others are, are saved people, I think, are just mistaken on this subject, on hating. Now, with every doctrine and every subject in the Bible, we have to take what's written in all of the Word, all of the context, all of the... The, the subject matter dealing with every you know, with these, whatever subject we're looking into, we have to find it all throughout Scripture because Scripture cannot be broken. It needs to be reconciled. There needs to be an explanation. There needs to be a reason. If you see things that might seem contradictory, how does it fit? How does it fit together? God's Word is perfect. I don't have to establish that for you today. Everyone here today believes already in God's Word. We know that this is preserved for us today. We know that it's the Word of God. We don't have to question whether or not, oh, does this belong in the Bible? We know it belongs there. We believe that. That is our foundation. This is the foundation of all we believe. So when we look at verses that may look appear to say different things, like a perfect example was last week when we looked at wine in the Bible. Okay, you could find statements that look completely contradictory. You say, well, what in the world is this talking about? But there's a very good explanation for it, and it makes perfect sense. Well, when the Bible's speaking extremely you know, evil and bad about, about this drink called wine, that's the alcoholic version. And when it's talking really good and a blessing and everything's great and you know it's a blessing of God, then that's the unfermented, the non-alcoholic wine. 
real simple. I mean, in the context, you could figure that out, but you need to, to, to look at all the scriptural references, all the teachings, the teachings on drunkenness, the teachings on drinking, you know, and look at all the passages to form your conclusion. And what happens is, and, and you also have to take into consideration if there's any changes between the Old Testament and New Testament. And what I believe and what we believe in here as a church is that unless the New Testament explicitly says that something has changed, then it hasn't. Right. That it still stands and that all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine. Because we use all the scripture for doctrine. Amen. So that's when you get the idiots will say, oh, well, what about eating shellfish? And, you know, and they're trying to be accused. Like, look, you obviously haven't read the Bible at all when it explicitly has been changed on the dietary subject. That has been changed. Levitical priesthood ordinances of making the sacrifices and that type of thing has been changed. The ceremonial laws of, of everything dealing with the you know, yes, that has been changed. But everything else still stands. If it hasn't been changed in the New Testament, so don't just say when we look at verses, oh well, that's the Old Testament. You, know, you can't just you can't look at that. Well, yes, we can. It's still God's word. And that's the way that we look at Scripture here. And even if something has changed, sometimes you can still get some, some value and, you know, and some, some understanding of the doctrine of the New Testament even by looking at the way things were done in the Old Testament. It's not just completely null and void. There's still profit in it. Now, we're going to be looking at some Scripture on hatred tonight. From the New Testament and from the Old Testament. Now, here in the Old Testament, and, you, and you'll find in both places different contexts of hatred and and what and, and, and or hate or hateth or you know any type of variation, abhor, you know, all these synonyms for hating, you will find both it's okay and not okay to do in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So um, here we see in Proverbs ten twelve, hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all things. Now that gives you a negative connotation of having hatred, does it not? Right? I mean, say, hey, if you have hatred, you're stirring up strife, you're causing fights, and you know we're not supposed to just be fighting and striving, and you know, and having all kind of fighting between. Now, on the other end, the Bible says to contend for the faith. What's contending? You're fighting, right? You're fighting for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. We ought to do that. But we ought not to just be fighting all the time, right? And just, and just starting fights and starting fights and starting fights. Right. We contend, we defend the faith, we stand up for the faith. Well, you know, when the battle comes, we're ready to fight. There's a spiritual warfare, we need the armor of God, right? But we ought not to just be striving and just disputing and getting into all kinds of stupid fights. Because you can do that all day, but it's a waste of time. The same thing with hatred. Now, hatred, I think in general here, if you're just kind of using the word loosely of just, just hating, I mean, we shouldn't just be going around hating people, right? Obviously, that's, that's all we're going to do is just stir up strife that way. But love covereth all sins. Now, Jesus Christ is a perfect example of love, right? He came, and he came to cover and to pay for all sins. And when he came, he didn't come to judge the world. He didn't come to hate on people, per se. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But what did Jesus do? I mean, if you even look at his life, are you going to say when he, you know, when he spoke to the, to the Pharisees and called them children of the devil and, and, you know, in Matthew 23 that, that that was loving? Or when Jesus sends people to hell... Is that loving? No. There is righteous hatred there. But when we're, when we're looking at how we ought to be living our lives and we're, and we're dealing with the context here, and again, in the context of Proverbs, so far, what we've seen up to this point is doing what's right versus doing what's evil. In just about every single verse, whether it's talking about you know, the different benefits or advantages of that, it's all talking about doing right versus doing wickedly. And now we see hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all things. We ought to be 
loving in general. And we ought to be uh, not be hating in general. But And we'll see here in, in Galatians 5. Flip over if you would to Galatians 5. We'll see a New Testament um, reference to having hatred. And a negative reference, by the way. And, and I'll mention this also as we say this. Because we're not going to every mention. I mean, look it up for yourself. There is hundreds and hundreds of mentions of hate, hateth, hatred, abhor. And look them all up for yourself. The majority of them are going to be negative. It's not a good thing to have in your life. You know, we ought not to have, you know, the Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So there's times when it's okay to be hated. There's a time to love and a time to hate, it says in Ecclesiastes. There is a time for it, but it's not something that should be done all the time by any means, and it's not something you should keep in your heart, but be able to let it go. Now, in Galatians 5, it says in verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. And it goes on and on. And it says uh, at the end of verse 21, they, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Hatred is listed in there. Okay. Now, if we wanted to just pull this one verse out and not look at the context of every other verse in the whole Bible, we could just say that all hate is bad. Which is what the world says right now. Now, how many doctrines do you think that are true and right from the Bible line up 100% exactly with what the world says? I can't think of any. Right? I mean, just just 100% completely, this is exactly what the world, the world teaches this. And hey, that's exactly what God's Word says. No, but the world says, all hatred, bad. No hate, hate, bad. And here we're seeing, hey, hatred is a work of the flesh. And it's listed with all these other works. So is a work of the flesh a good thing in this context? Absolutely not. You're not walking in the spirit here. You're walking in the flesh. Because then it goes on to tell you that the fruit of the spirit, you know, and it lists all the fruits of the spirit. Now, Again, the importance of getting the entire context of this of a subject like this throughout the whole Bible to understand and comprehend the teaching that God's trying to get through to us. In general, yes, hate you don't you shouldn't just be hateful, a hateful person just hating all the time, hating people, you know, having that hatred in your heart just all the time, but think about this one verse. Because all Scripture has to be reconciled. If you just say, well, the Bible says here, hatred is a work of the flesh. How do you account for Psalm 97, verse 10, that says, Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. As a command. Hey, do you love God? Hate evil. Well, wait, hatred's a work of the flesh. Now you're going to add a conundrum. What are you going to do? If you're going to take this verse and just say, well... Hatred is just, just of the flesh. You that love the Lord, hate. Well, then this has to mean, you know, what does it mean? Mm-hmm. It's all dictated on context. Mm-hmm. What is it talking about? What are these verses talking about? What is the teaching here, really, when you have a verse that says, Hatred is a, is a work of the flesh, but then it says, You that love the Lord, hate evil. He preserveth the souls of the saints, He delivered them out of the hand of the wicked. But Psalm 101, verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Again, that's a a positive mention and usage of the word hate. Is David in the flesh here by saying that I hate the work of them that turn aside? Or is he in the spirit as he's penning down the word of God? I say he's in the spirit. Yeah. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge also. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the evil way in the froward mouth do I hate. The verses have to come into um, communion here. They have to, they have to fit. 
how does it fit then? You, it, the only way it could fit is to say, well, not all hatred of every sort, of every kind, is a work of the flesh. It can't be. It can't be. Because how can the Bible be telling you to hate evil, hate evil, hate the work of them that turn aside? And see, a lot of people say, well, yeah, that's just talking about hating the sin. Right? And, and you know what? In these verses and in this context, yes. Yes. I don't think that's all it's referring to, but yes, you know what? That's fine. I, I have no problem saying that. You that love the Lord hate evil. It doesn't say hate a person there. It says hate evil. Hate the work of them that turn aside and shall not cleave to me. Okay, fair enough. Yes, absolutely. Fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy in the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. Sure. Absolutely. Many verses of things we're supposed to hate. And you know what? This isn't all. Don't think that like I threw just all. Like, this is all of the verses that telling you to hate. No. There's not enough time in the sermon, like I said before, to go through this. Study it out for yourself and you'll see what I'm talking about because you need to do that to get the full view and context of teaching on this doctrine from the Bible. But there is sinful hatred and a righteous hatred. People want to paint, though, with a broad brush and make this topic more simple than it actually is. Now, I was saying, you know, the, the works that, that in these verses I saw so far, yes, that's true. We're going to get to, in just, in just a few minutes, more verses that explain that it's not just the works, but it's actually some people, too, that the Bible talks about here. Now, turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. I want you to see this. Follow with me as we go to these verses. Luke chapter 6. People that are painting with a broad brush on the subject are making it more simple than it really is. Because it really is, um, you need to have a deeper understanding of, of just hatred in general and what's right and what's not right from the Bible here. Look at Luke chapter 6 and verse 27. New Testament, Jesus Christ speaking, right? But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Now, for everyone that wants to go to one verse like this in the New Testament and then disregard all of the Old Testament admonitions on hating, how do you deal with this verse? Turn if you go to Luke 14. And you know what I say to Luke 6, 27, we just read, Amen and Amen. Absolutely. We ought to do good to them which hate us. We ought to love our enemies. We should. Jesus Christ said so. I believe it. Right. Yes, we should. But you know what? That's also taught in the Old Testament. Right. This same exact concept is taught in the Old Testament. This is not something new. I heard someone say recently that, oh, well, Jesus came and he made it even a higher requirement of loving your enemies. No. Just because he says you have heard it said, hate your enemies, does not mean that it was taught in the Bible. Just because he says you've heard it said that thus and so, does not mean that is what the scripture says. Right. Because the scripture doesn't say hate your enemies. It actually does say to love your enemies. The same exact topic is taught. It's not anything that he's even making harder for us in the New Testament. It's the same teaching. Look at Luke 14, verse 26. Okay, out of the words of Jesus Christ again. And remember, keep in mind Galatians 5. Verse 26. If any man come to me... And hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters. Yea, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Looks to me like you can't even be a disciple of Jesus Christ without hating. Now I'm sure they'll say, oh, oh, but what he means there is. But that's exactly my point. Yes. What does he mean there? Because I agree, the hatred that he's talking about here is not the same hatred that's mentioned in Galatians 5. They're talking about different things. You don't have the same hatred for your mother and your father that it's talking about of being in the flesh and having the hatred found in Galatians 5. So, don't tell me now, oh, you're just trying, you know, you're just trying to make it sound like you could just hate every, no. No, no, no. But 
you need to do something with this verse then too if you're going to say all hate is bad. Yeah. If you're going to say it's never done, what are you going to do with that verse? Oh, it means something different? Okay, now we're, now we're getting on the same page. Because I say it's dictated by the context on what it's even talking about. As I write, turn if you to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. As I mentioned earlier, I brought up Ecclesiastes 3.8. You know, it says there's a time to love and a time to hate. Time of war, time of peace. There's time for, there's, there's a right time and a right place for all these things to exist. The question is figuring out, well, what is the right time? Obviously, the right time we already saw before for hating is hate the evil way. Hate the evil work. Hate the, you know, hate the work of them that, that, you know, that, that do evil. That's a righteous time to hate. And in this context, with Jesus Christ, he says, you know, I hate your father. Again, I think that's a, it's a, it's a, the way it's used. And when you look at it in the context, it's being his disciple and, you know, not loving your fa- even your family, people closest to you more than God. And, you know, allowing them to get in the way, you know, the Bible says, he says, you cannot love, uh, um, you cannot serve God and mammon. Very close in this context. You, you, you can't, you can't love God. He says, because you're going to love the one and hate the other. It's, 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 it's one and the other. You can't, you can't love both. You say, you can't love God and money. It's impossible. You say, yeah, but I can. No, you can't. Jesus said you can't. Right. He says, you're going to love the one and hate the other. So if you're serving money at all, like you might not even say that you feel hate in your heart. But according to Scripture, you hate God if, you're just, if you love money. Right. You can't have it both ways. According to Jesus Christ, according to the Bible. So, again, yes, based on the context, I don't think this is the same exact hatred that is referring to in Galatians 5. Nor do I even think that this is the same hatred that it's referring to when it says to hate the evil. I don't think it's the same hatred that you have in order to be Jesus' disciple. But you see, you have to be able to answer all these scriptures. You have to be able to turn to them. And I think conveniently, when people are doing their studies on hatred and stuff, they leave out all these hard verses. Because they just want to make it sound so crystal clear from the few that they cherry pick. Mm-hmm. You got to answer them. Psalm 139, verse 21. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Now it's talking about people. We saw hating the evil way and hating wickedness and that type of stuff. Now we say, look, them, those, O Lord, that hate thee. He says, I hate them. And not only that, he calls it a perfect hatred. It's a perfect hatred. It's complete. It doesn't mean without error. It's just, it's, it's, he said, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I fully hate them. I count them my enemies. And these are people that hate God. Romans 1 talks about also people that hate God. And people are given over to a reprobate mind. Again, and this is not your average unsaved person. Your average unsaved person is not labeled, according to the Bible, a hater of God. That is not your average unsaved person. Even the Apostle Paul, who fought against the church of God, and fought against the right ways... The Bible says that he did it ignorantly in unbelief. He was not a hater of God. He was not a reprobate described in Romans chapter 1. It was not the Apostle Paul. He was an unbeliever. He did things ignorantly, thinking he was doing what's right, you know, trying to serve God. He didn't know God. He was trying to serve God, and he did it completely ignorantly and foolishly and actually fought against the cause of Christ. But he was not a hater of God. And what we see here in Psalm 139 is consistent with what's in Romans chapter 1. Being a hater of God. You know what? That is someone that I hate. 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse number 2. You can turn it if you'd like. I'll just read it for you. It says, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king Jehoshaphat, and said to king Jehoshaphat Shouldest thou help the ungodly? And love them that hate the Lord. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. 
You say, what are you thinking? So, we have two places here. One in Psalm 139 saying, hey, I hate them that hate thee, that are haters of God. I hate them with a perfect hatred. And that's through, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit as a righteous thing. Right. And now we see the flip side of the same coin. Somebody, what are you doing loving them that hate the Lord and being rebuked for it and saying, God's wrath is going to come on you now because you're loving them that hate God. The same people, those that hate God. Again, look, hey, look up the times where the Bible talks about people who hate the Lord and hate God. And see who it's talking about. Okay, do that. It's a whole other study to do. Figure this stuff out. It's important. Look, if you care about the Bible and if you care about having the right doctrine, study it out for yourself and look it up. And see, you know what? This doesn't sit right. Because you know what? Honestly, the first time I heard about any of this, it, it sounded kind of strange. It didn't sit right with me. Why? Because I'd never heard it before. Right. Because all I ever heard was what this world had to say about hate bad, love good, and everything is just love, love, love. But you got to answer these. I'm waiting for an answer. I'm asking, well, that's Old Testament. You know what? That doesn't work for me. That's Old Testament. Show me in the New Testament where this is done away. Show me where the Psalms are done away. When they're being quoted time after time after time in the New Testament as Scripture. Right. That, that, that stands as truth of the Lord. And not going to this and saying, well, this is different. Turn back, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 10. We need to, get, we need to, to take the Bible seriously and be able to, to, to make sure everything fits together. I, I don't think it's that difficult of a doctrine to understand that. There's these few exceptions of when it's right, well, righteous hatred. Because it is few. And when you look up all, all, all up the references, look up all the references, there's not nearly as many of these types of verses. I did pick out the majority of them tonight. Not all of them, but the majority of them, I would say. I, I mean, I didn't count them. I have to count them. But there's not very many that's, that's talking about a good, you know, a good way of hatred. Or, or a righteous hatred, or, or when it's when it's okay to even have that hatred at all. Very few, and it's it's so specific. Where when it's talking about people, it's talking about one small percentage group of people that hate God, and that's it. Because the vast majority of people don't, and we ought not to have the hatred by and large. So, what I think happens sometimes is that the teaching needs to be done to get through all the brainwashing. So. But I don't want you to walk away thinking that, like, oh, well, we can just hate everybody. You know, because uh, that is completely false. And then you completely miss the whole point of what I'm trying to say here at all. And you're missing what we're even studying in Proverbs when it's talking about um, hatred stirreth up strives, but love covereth all sins. You know, we ought to, we ought to be um, not known, you know, like, for our hatred for right. people. And it should be something that you're just... Uh, Going around being hateful towards everybody, because and actually, you know, the churches that teaches all churches I know, they actually love people quite a bit because they invest a lot of time and resources and energy bringing the gospel out to people, and the vast majority of the people you talk to, it's all in love. And the only time you even hear about the hate is when it's in the, the teaching part inside of the, the, the congregation learning from God's word. Or when the attacks come from the haters of God, then you're going to see the hatred come out because it's a perfect hatred, because it's righteous. And in these days, there happens to be a very vocal group of haters of God. So you're going to see more of that. And what can I say? I mean, it, this is what the Bible says. But, um, you know, for other people that are haters of God and that are not reprobates, no, we don't, we don't hate them at all. And that's why we just spent an hour out today knocking on their doors and preaching the gospel to them. And we do that every week and we spend hours and hours 
on a weekly basis doing the same exact thing. And you know what? That is the main focal point. We're the focus point of this ministry because you know, people like to find one little clip on YouTube online and say, oh, you guys are all just a bunch of hate miners and hate AO and we're not, you're not allowed to be loud here and stuff. You have no idea what goes on with the church and any of the good that goes on. You just see one thing that you don't like and you blow up over it. Right. And you think that characterizes, and even these idiots online say, oh, you're characterized by hate. People have never even been to the church before. You have no idea what kind of ministry is going on inside, day in, day out, within the church, within you know, all of the multiple activities and soul winning and help that's going on amongst the congregation and outside of the congregation. And all these churches that are doing this, they find one thing that you're characterized by hate. Why? Because the media blows it up and, and this, that's all anyone could ever focus on. That's right. And you forget about the hundreds of other sermons that are preached on all the other subjects in the Bible. On being good, being giving, good, you know, being uh, righteous, doing all these different things, completely you know, just throw all that to the side. You're characterized by hate. Okay. You know, I mean, at that point, just throw up your hands. Fine. If, if that's what you want to call me, you know, then I guess I'll be blessed when, when people are going to speak evil of you falsely for my name's sake. You want to throw around my name as being a hate monger because I actually believe the word of God and that there is a, such a thing as a perfect hatred for people that hate God? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Amen. Have a field day with it. But let's go back to Proverbs chapter 10. All right, where did we leave off? Because I think I skipped a little bit in my notes. To, uh, verse 12. Yeah, verse 13. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. I'm going to to move on a little bit here for time. Proverbs uh, 16, the labor of the righteous tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked to sin. He is in the way of life that keepeth instruction, but he that refuseth reproof, earth. Verse 18. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. So here we have another reference of hatred. And so when you when you hide your own hate by lying about it, right? You actually hate someone, but you're going to lie about it. And you know, a lot of people that do this, it says, and he that other slander is a fool. It says, you're a fool if you hide that hatred with lying lips. Like the people that actually hate the homos, but tell them that they love them. Yeah. You're a fool. Don't do that. Don't lie about it. And unfortunately, a lot of people lying about that type of thing. They, why? Because they don't want the attacks to come. They don't want the, the media. They don't want to look bad in the world's eyes. Right. Because they care about what men think more than what about God thinks. And he that uttereth a slander... Again, this is, this, this is just beyond belief in the online world. It's people slandering other people. Again, people who have no idea, never been out to a church before, never seen the full proof of the ministry because they see some clips online, they see a few sermons or clips, portions of sermons, and they're ready to just slander people left and right. It's wickedness. It's foolishness. Verse 19, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. Oh, here, 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 please listen up to this great, this is a, a gem right here. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Very wise saying, memorize this scripture. Too often people just feel the need to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. I don't know where need comes from, but you ought to be able to regulate and monitor the things that you say. And you know what? The more loose you are with the lips, the more likely you are to be sinning and talking about things that you shouldn't be talking about, talking about other people's business, maybe uttering a slander, maybe, you know, whatever. The more words that come out of your mouth, the more likelihood it is that you are going to be in sin. We need to be able to Take a break for a second and think about what he says. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. Now, 
Sometimes you hear about things and, oh man, it might be real juicy. You know, you might just want, you just can't wait to talk about it. If you could refrain your lips, you're wise. You don't need to be spreading gossip. You don't need to be backed by, you don't need to be talking about other people. You know, refrain your lips because the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. And we're getting into a section here that's dealing with the things that you say. So from verses 18 here through, let's see, I've got a mark 21. These four verses are all talking about things that come out of our mouth and what we say. Verse 18 was he that hideth hatred with lying lips. Again, right? Lying, using your lips lies. And uttereth the slander. So the things that you're saying, you're slandering, you're a fool. Multitude of words, or wanteth not sin. And, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Verse 20, the tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. So the things that you say when you're you know, being a just person and speaking righteously... That's great. That's like that. I mean, that's that's like value, valuable as silver is valuable. It's high in value. Verse twenty one: the lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. So obviously, they're being fed is by feeding people with wisdom, feeding them with truth, feeding them with knowledge, with manna, with you know, with the with the goodness of God's word is how people are being fed. Um, by the lips of the righteous. And we ought to be careful with the things. Jump down if you would to verse 31 there in Proverbs, the, the last two verses. The Bible reads, The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh frowardness. Now, flip over if you would to the book of James, the last place we're going to turn. James chapter 1. James 1 and especially in James 3, we're going to get some, a little bit extra wisdom just on dealing with the things that you speak and the things that you say and being able to watch your tongue and, and um, be careful with what you say. We need to recognize the damage that can be done with the words that you use. And you ought to be very careful to choose your words wisely right. and to not be... I mean, for one, people are always going to be looking to trap you in your words and snare you in your words. And the wicked people that are out there and people who claim to be Christians, they've already done this. You know, It's like they're waiting for someone to slip up. They're waiting for you to just to say the wrong thing so they can capture it and just throw it out there. You know what? That's wicked. And you know, you really ought not to be doing that for anyone just... You know, taking someone out of context or just, just, just waiting for that one thing, especially when you know. I mean, anyone who does, who, who speaks often, like a preacher, everybody makes mistakes. I have made mistakes. I have misspoken in the past. And you know what's a wicked thing to just jump on one area where you misspeak? Maybe you don't explain yourself just, just fully or, or fully perfect, and you, and you make that one error. Don't jump on that. Don't jump on that one thing and blow it up to be way more than it is. That's not right. And that shouldn't be done. I mean, you can, I'm sure it could be done to me. I don't know if it has been or not, but I mean, it, it easily could. Because when you talk for an hour, something isn't going to come out just right because I'm not perfect. Even though that's not my intent. Or, you know, sometimes you say things you don't even necessarily mean, but we ought to be careful. You know, I'm not just, I'm not just excusing myself. You know, it ought to be something that, that everybody is diligent about and try your best to make sure that whatever comes out of your mouth... You know, you can't be trapped. They were trying to trap Jesus in his words all the time. They're trying trying to catch him. You know, that's why they brought the, the woman in adultery. That's why they're asking him all these questions about what's the greatest law and the greatest you know, And they're trying to trap him at any point to try to get him to, to be in a quandary to say something either against Caesar or against God's law and just trying to trap him and trick him. So we need to be careful with the words that we use because there's always going to be a text and people that are listening to you. And you ought just not to be um, getting into sin anyways and just speaking things you ought not. James chapter 1, verse number 19, the Bible reads, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So we ought to be quick to hear. Be, be, be all ears. When people are talking, listen up, listen to everything that they're saying, and make sure that your response is slow. Slow to speak, that you get, you know, and what, one of the, the, the best pieces of advice there is, especially when you get emotional. When people, because words can really 
raise emotions. <laughs> You get people pretty hot. You get pretty angry. You get, you, know, you get pretty sad. You can, you, you know, all kinds of emotion can be stirred up just by some words. You can say some real strong words and get people really upset. And what you want to try your best to do is make sure that you're not speaking foolishly. You're not speaking quickly and just reacting. Because when you react without thinking, you're going to end up saying things that you don't mean. And this is why, I mean, it happens. Anyone who's had any relationships with people, you know, especially married people, you get in an argument, you get in a fight, and ultimately someone says something that shouldn't have been said because they got angry, because they got upset. And unfortunately, with your words, when they come out of your mouth, you can't draw them back in and take it back as if it never happened. It's already been said. And the damage is done. And sometimes the damage can be severe. The damage of words that people use can break marriages. Mm-hmm. I mean, literally, it, it can cause so much destruction. Let's look at James chapter 3. Flip over to chapter 3. We're going to see what the tongue is capable of according to the Bible. Because it can do all kinds of damage. Which is why we need to be swift to hear. This is what people have to say. But slow to speak. Make sure the things that come out of your mouth are, are, are thought about and go through your filter of, is this really the right thing I should be saying at this point and be able to check yourself or am I just really upset and take a breath before I respond? If you're wise, you'll take that breath. You'll just, you'll wait a minute. Right. You don't have to immediately respond. You don't have to be the guy that's got all the quick comebacks. I've never been that guy. <laughs> and you know what? Now, I used to think like, man, I wish I was just really good at just having these quick comebacks. I don't think that way anymore. Because yeah. you know what? It doesn't matter. I'd rather think about the things that I say and say it right than screw up and say something wrong just to be witty or just to be clever. You know, I, I, that doesn't matter. Because that's kind of just a little proud anyways if you could just, you know have that, right. that, that, that winning of words in that way. I'd rather just say what's right and say what's true. Look at James chapter 3, verse number 5. The Bible says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Is that, is that a strong enough warning for you on, on how you ought to deal with your tongue and the things that you say? I mean, the fire that's kindled is of hell. See, it's, just a small, it's just a small part of your body. Yeah, your tongue is real small. But look how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Right. You know, all these fires, we have a lot of fires out here in Arizona too, in the, in the wooded areas and stuff. All these great, huge forest fires, they all start from something small. That's right. Lightning bolt, campfire, cigarette. Little bit, just a, just a little bit thrown out there. One little cigarette thrown out the window. <sighs> huge blaze before you know it. Turns into this, this huge disaster. Misspeaking the wrong words. Could just be a little, just a few words can blow up into, into way more than you want to deal with. The Bible says in verse 7, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. You know, we're, able, you're, we're capable of taming animals. Even the most wild of beasts can be brought into subjection and be tamed. And not be wild anymore. You see the, you know, the wild horses that are running free. And you try to, you try to, to break a horse, right? They're, they're kicking and stomping and everything else. And they're all over the place. They cause all kinds of destruction. But they could be tamed. They could be taught. You know what? You're gonna have, you know, they're they're going to obey. They'd be brought into subjection. It says, but verse 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing, my brother, and these things ought not so to be. Be careful with the things that you say. Be wise about that. You know, the multitude of words that wanteth not sin, there's, you know, the, that's what we're learning from the book of Proverbs. And my last point here, if you want to flip back to Proverbs 10, we're done. Um, I'm not even going to read all the rest of the verses. I just want to look at verse number 24 and 25 here. We read the whole chapter before we started. Uh, Verse 24 and 25 says, The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. 
As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more, but the righteous is an everlasting foundation. Now, a whirlwind can be very loud and scary and make you feel uncomfortable, make you feel scared, right? I mean, you know, a whirlwind's like a tornado. I don't know about you. Has anyone has anyone ever been like like at least around or close to a tornado at all in their lifetime? Because I have. I grew up in the, in the south suburbs of, of Chicago, and it was close enough to still be getting the tornado warnings and stuff. And I've been around it, not actually in the middle of it, but even just being close enough to it, it's a uh, it's pretty scary. It could be pretty scary. It's intense. It's it's uh, you know the, the the great power. It makes you feel so weak and helpless when confronted with such a strong power of just you know of God. Right. Is what it is. It's the power of God just in this whirlwind. And that's the illustration being used here. It says as the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more. So. The, the wicked can be very loud and maybe very scary and make you get real uncomfortable and nervous, right? But it'll pass. It goes away. Those storms, they come and they go. You know, they, 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 could, they could look and sound real, real loud and scary, but then they're just gone. And the Bible's saying here, you know, as the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more. They're gone. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. Those the, the whirlwind passes, the wicked are going to pass away and they're going to burn in hell. But we have a foundation that is sure that we can stand on and not be scared and not be worried. You know, it says the fear of the wicked shall come upon them. They're going to they're going to receive their own fear. Right. See, they try to present fear, the wicked. They try to make you scared. They try to make you afraid. They try to get you to shut up. They try to back you down and fight you up with their using fear and fear tactics. But their fear is going to come upon them when they're standing before God. That's right. It says, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. We don't. We ought not to let ourselves fear the wicked. We've got a sure foundation. We, we've got the rock. We, we, know, we know the truth. We have the truth. We're on the winning side. And as, as scary as it may seem sometimes, don't, don't let it get to you. That's, this is like a world. It's going to come, and it's just going to dissipate. It's going to go away and become nothing. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great truths and the wisdom found in your book. God, I pray that you please help us all to learn from these words, dear Lord. Help us to grow um, ever closer to the to the image of your Son. Help us to understand some of these doctrines and topics that that um, many people, I believe, get wrong. And, but just help us to do what's right in your sight, dear Lord. Because we, all we care about is what's right by you. We don't care what anybody else says or thinks, dear Lord. It doesn't matter to us what people, what other people think about us, what other people teach from your word, as long as we know that what you're teaching us is truth and right, dear Lord. Help us to have that understanding. Lord, we have a heart, you know, that loves people. We have a heart that wants to win people to Christ, dear Lord. We really do care about people and want what's best for them, dear Lord. And, um, and help us to demonstrate that love more completely. But Lord, we also know that there are a lot of people that hate you, that are enemies, and um, that are enemies of the cross of Christ, and that, and that are reprobates, dear Lord, and that you have already rejected them. Lord, help us to, to maintain this, this correct uh, belief and, and just lead us into the, 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 the path, dear Lord, of um, knowing where, at what point we ought to stop with the, with our hatred and to start with it, dear Lord, when, what the right times are to love and to hate. And God, we also pray that you would please just help us to monitor the things that we say and um, make sure that we are, are very careful with those words and we're not quick to speak, but rather slow to speak, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.